So for building this app, I'm just going to cover the core concepts of Marionette. So that's going to be routing layouts and views, event handling, and of course rendering your data on, on the screen. Uh, I won't go into too much depth on a lot of these issues. So uh, Andrew, who's doing the next talk, is going to go through more depth on the views. Um, and handling the user input and things like that, I'll, I'll only briefly touch because that's a whole topic in and of itself. So I'm the lead developer at Pebble. We specialize in income generation for schools. We're based down in near the Stepney Bank Stables, uh, near Bike App, for anybody familiar with the area. We build our applications using Python and Django uh, for the back-end web services uh, and then the front-end web apps, obviously in JavaScript. Uh, so the JavaScript for it really has three core elements, three core jobs. You generate HTML, you integrate with the server, so that's like pushing, pulling data, and you respond to user input. And everything else is just a variation or a combination of those three themes. Uh, <clears throat> And each framework does its own, has its own story for doing that. So why did we at Pebble choose Marionette? Well, we already had some experience using Backbone uh, back when it first came out. Uh, we built a mobile app, web app using Backbone. <coughs> and there's always value in taking what you've already built on, what you've already learned, and building on that. Uh, the have been frameworks came out since, but because we already knew Backbone, we wanted to keep using that knowledge as much as possible, so that's why that eventually led us to Marionette. It doesn't have any magic, well, just a little bit, uh, but that's all really like, quite clear in the source code. It's been annotated, it's quite, it is very clear, and also the source of backbone itself is just well documented and annotated as well on the websites themselves, and <coughs> those at the end of the talk. It's under active development, uh, and it has a really helpful and friend friendly community. Uh, they're always available on the GitHub channels, similar to IRC. Uh, they're all linked on from the repository, so they're quite easy to find. And they're always willing to help and talk you through how to build, how, how to work through the issues that you're coming across. So for the application, we're going to build some sort of a, a sort of microblog. It's just going to be a really simple list of tweet-like objects. You can click on an item to do the connect any sort. Of comments connected to that. It's not going to look pretty, we're just going to focus really on the HTML output. Because you can build that really as complicated as, as you like, as you, as you become more familiar with, with uh, Marionette or, or web development in general. Uh, so, uh, before I move on, I will just show you... Uh, two seconds. Code itself. There we go. So, this is just the index that's all going to hook into. Uh, the important, the really important part are that's the source code for the application itself, the compiled output, and this is going to be the root where the application it then lives. It, you, you're going to see it in just a second, but that's where everything's going to then come from. Uh, that that single layout div. Uh, so an, app, an application really just, it links the, the initial page load into your app. It, it's about just getting things running. So you can use that feed information in from your web server. You can inject it at the page and then the application can inject that. The application object can inject that into the future application. So sometimes that's things like uh, initial data loads. So if you pull down a list, you don't want to run a second request to get that list. You could just stick it in the HTML and then load it straight away, and then start acting as an AJAX application. Uh, you could also put in like routes uh, and other layouts, things like that. Uh, so, what does an application look like? So, th this is the initial data that I'm going to feed into the application. So, it's just a list of these items. There's two items, uh, and then each of them has a short list of comments. And then here's the application itself. And it, it is really quite quite a simple piece of code. You just listen for this for the start event. If, if for people are familiar with event programming, this is a common pattern. Uh, we're going to initialize the routes, which I'm going to go into in just a second. We're going to start 
the the air route listing app as well, which comes from Backbone. Uh, and then we just start the application and tell it the data that's going to get started with. So now we're getting the route out, which is a really juicy uh, part. Uh, it's a really misunderstood part. <clears throat> the key thing with the route app is that it reads the fragment of your URL and uses that to figure out how to figure out what data, what views, what screens to show, what data to pull from the server, all of that. So it's really like a starting point of your application. The reason you use it is that you can then, if, for people who are familiar with Twitter, I used to use a hash bank URLs. So you'd have fragment and then the actual tweet reference. It would basically would use that, pull the tweet, then it would do another request to get the actual tweet itself. And it would use the fragment to figure out which tweet they use. The app I saw serves basically the same job. It then has a controller, which are the met essentially, if, if the root has the keys, the controller has the values, the methods that you're gonna call. So you have a root saying, uh, Oh, I'm going really back for it. Very max. So, it's easier to start looking at it. I've explained those two concepts because they're very closely linked. So, you have an app root app, we have a root URL, and then we've got a blog, uh, blog entry URL. So, these are your two keys. Then you can pass variables in as well, that's documented on the Backbone website, and then the methods that it's actually going to call. We then initialize the controller, pass that in. And this is a controller here. So we initialize that controller. We're going to pass in the data that's come from the application, that's come from the page. Um, I explain the region in two seconds, but you, the important part here is you've got your, you have your methods here. So you reference them in the app router. And you know, then the controller knows what they are. The router knows what they are and looks for them on the controller. It will fail if it doesn't find those methods and your application won't start. Uh, so, so that's really a basic root and controller. So what, what we're going to, what, what then happens is when backbone history start gets called from the application, it reads the fragment part. So if you just loaded a page like this, you notice the fragment's empty. So it says let's <clears throat> let's use that empty root, which is to list all of the entry, all of those items, which is what we've defined to do here. So we're going to move on into the views a bit. Um, just one last thing for, for the routers is that there is a there are a lot of strategies and there's a lot of debate about how to use them. Um, it, the exact usage really depends on your application. So I, I couldn't I can't give any really good hard and fast rules. Just be aware that you should uh, just be aware that it, it runs at the start of your application, initializes everything, and then everything gets handled by your views after that. So your views here uh, deal with data rendering, so writing that HTML out, handling user input events, uh, can also handle data changing from the server, so if you want to fetch that list and you need to re-render it, you can listen to the list of data being fetched from the server, and then it'll re-render when that happens. Uh, when that completes. Uh, so what, what do views look like? So well, when you initialize them, you can pass in sort of any sort of information you want. So in the list, we're going to pass in that, that list of uh, blog posts uh, as, collect, as this dot collection, which got initialized just up here. Um, yeah, so, so passing the collection, it then renders it. It knows how to render a collection. And the view itself is, we'll pick the wrong one, is yeah. So it's an ordered list of type collection view. Each one, each of these collection views has its own type. Uh, that each of these items in the collection view has a type that you define. So again, that's a list item. And we also handle the template in the item view. So I will then open that up, and you'll see we have some variables. Uh, so the text and then by author. I'll go back to that, and you can see that is here. So there's the text by author by me. And if we go back up here, 
just to sort of close the loop there, we say author and text is the variables on the individual items. And that takes us into models. So really the models are the actual individual items of data that you would be referencing. They bind your application to the server data, so you can, fetch, you can call the fetch method, that will pull data, or you can call the save method, and that'll take the data that you've input on the model in your application and try and synchronize it with the server. Models are quite clever, they actually understand whether you should save a new item or the, whether you want to update an existing item. That's, you, that's caused by it knowing if it basically has an ID field that's come from the server. So if you've created a new one, it'll get an ID field and say, okay, now there's a new update. Alternatively, you've pulled it from the server, so it knows I'm just going to update back to the server. I haven't actually created an, I'm creating an instance of a model, but I will show you. You can pull them out of these collections, and I'll explain that in a second. It's there. So what what actually happens with the collection is each one becomes a model. In here. So this is the individual blog item you actually can. Oh. Yeah, sorry. This is the issue with live code, like using the editor live. So yeah, there we are. So you can pull this out here, and we have a mock instance of a model, um, and, and that has some helper methods on it to help you get and set, and then it can also go into the actual individual items and gets rendered. The next step of a model is a collection, which is just a list of models. That's an optional type check-in, so you can tell a collect you can create extend the collection class and tell it all models must be of this type and they'll ensure that happens for you. Collections are pr pretty key and you've already, <coughs> you've already seen them here on the collection view when they get instantiated. And we can also instantiate them when we have our individual item in here. No, not there. Keep going the wrong one. Uh, I don't know, what's there? That's the one here. So we instantiate the collection here. So if, if we recall, go back into the application, each of these had a list of comments. So what we can do is we can turn that list there into the collection on each item. And now we basically nested a list inside a list. So if I go and click on here to get an individual item, we get the list of comments in that actual, in that template there. And they're actually just the same template as we saw before. Uh, I just reused that quite, quite nicely there. And so the, the next part, really the sort of final thing is sort of handling the user input. This is actually really nice, a nice part of Marinette. I actually really like it. What we will do is, so normally what you can do is we could just turn those into URLs. But for the purpose of the demo, I've basically created some uh, trigger handlers to do the routing manually in JavaScript. So when you hover here, when we actually click here, these aren't actually links. So click inspect element, comes up and they just list items with the hover style on them. So what I'll do, on each blog item, we have a trigger. This is for the click event. Click event, this is just a jQuery uh, handler. So the jQuery click event triggers, executes a trigger that's just a custom name. You can give it any name you like. In this case, we'll call it view blog. We could listen to it here if we want, if we chose to. So I could do. So, so we could listen to it here. Uh, th this is basically a standard form of listening for triggers. You start by prefixing it with on. And if you recall, on show as well at the very start, that was also a trigger that, that was uh, sent when we called start. 
And then each of these, uh, every word is separate by a colon, and we use that as our boundaries for the capital letters. Uh, collection views have a nice property in that they can listen to their children, so each each of those individual items will propagate a trigger at one level up to the collection view. And what, we, what we'll do is we'll prefix it with child view between the on and the view block. And now we get access to the child, we actually get an access, access to the instance that was created when that collection was rendered. So we want to grab that model that exists there. We'll call the history navigate and what this does is that just changes this fragment. So when I click on there, it, it amends that, it adds this part to the fragment, changes the fragment to that, and then calls the method back up, all the way back up on the controller. And if we go back up to the controller, that was this item here. So uh, the blog entry, which is the same code that would get called if I'm here and I, could, I decide to refresh the page, and we'll see that it's basically it is the same code uh, that got executed. So it'll always get rendered the same way. There are different ways, as I said, to sort of handle that. So some people might put up further down and have the controller access it, but I've, for simplicity, I've just done it all at the top level. Um, so, so that's been that uh, trigger. We also have a back button to click which just does exactly the same in reverse. Uh, but I've just made it a little bit more complex. I've created a, what, what we call a UI hash. All this is, is basically a cached reference to the jQuery selector. So with reference dot back, I'll just hover over, just so you can see that it has a class of back. So let's use that jQuery selector there. Now when, when you click click, we just reference it inside the inside the trigger, click it, and then on back gets called, and exactly the same happens in, in reverse. Uh, we call navigate, and then we call the actual method itself that we want to call, and we'll get back to the root uh, hammer. We can also listen for model changes. I haven't put an example in here yet, in here, but if what you can do as well is listen for if say field changes on the model. So if you if you've um, on the underlying post, if you have say a form handline, you want to reflect changes in a stylized preview pane, you can actually type and as that uh, text gets entered, you can be updating the model and then the preview pane can be <coughs> updates of what you typed in the final format of what of how you want it to look when you actually send it to the to the user or when you posted that item. You can listen for collection changes. So if you add items to a list and you display in a list, you can insert them in and then the collection view will automatically re-render itself with the new item in the correct place in the order where it was in the collection. Uh, so yeah there's, there's a few there's a few ways there's a lot of ways you can listen for the uh, handlers. Again, you can also click when you saved an item, it could check the server, and if the server said I didn't like this, it could send it back with the list of errors. You can listen for the list of errors and render them all to the user. So you've got lots of options for actually handling all the different things that can happen with your application. Uh, and, and there's a lot more about this, which I won't go into because again, like I say, whole talks on themselves. So we can share different behaviors for views. So if you say have a dialog box, that could be open and closed, we could turn that into a behavior and then share that dialog box behavior across lots of different types of views. We have global event handlers with the radio. You can switch in and out template engines. A common thing people do is change the underscore, the default template engine called underscore templates with uh, mustache templates, which look like the Django templates, if people, or Jinja templates, if people are familiar with those backend frameworks. I haven't went into regions in great detail. I showed you, you saw the region hand, I haven't really explained that. Uh, if I have time, I could go through that. But 
you can also, there's also Underscore itself, which is a, a fantastic JavaScript library. It's written by the same guy who did, um, who did CoffeeScript. Uh, and to be honest, I think he just rendered CoffeeScript obsolete just by writing Underscore. It does most of the things that Coffee, you would use CoffeeScript for. It's a fantastic library, so I'd really recommend you. Even if you don't want to use Marionette, just read the Underscore documentation. It's a great piece of software. Uh, and then we have helpful links, yeah. So we've got the GitHub channel. Uh, so I'm active, uh, Andrew here is active, uh, and a lot of, there's a lot of guys help, are really helpful guys are active on there. Backbone underscore Marionette documentation in that order. Uh, it <coughs> and all, all those systems because they're all used heavily in Marionette and they all will reference each other. And also there's a great YouTube channel called Dancing with Marionette where they, ex they go into a lot of in-depth on different topics on Marionette and uh, it's been a fantastic help for me understanding a lot of those, uh, a lot of these uh, concepts myself. So I'd recommend that YouTube channel as well. And they do it a lot better than I do actually talking. Uh, so yeah, and that's really it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, is jQuery a required dependency? Yes. Because it's quite a bulky thing to include, yeah. in most modern browsers kind of around yeah. the need for it. Yeah, um, jQuery is a library that exposes the same interface, so Zepto.js is, oh, okay. can also will be used. I have used that before, uh, but I tend to just use jQuery just because of its ubiquity. Uh, but yeah, it's a hard requirement. I know there has been discussion about trying to remove it as a requirement. Um, it, it's a, yeah, it's unfortunate, it's, it is still required. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so is underscore like sort of a utility library that comes in time with this? Yeah, underscore is a utility library. It's, uh, it, it's a requirement for Backbone and sort of a requirement for Marionette. It, it is a really good utility library it, just by itself. It includes uh, constructs for basic functional programming over collections uh, and specific functions for dealing with arrays, objects, other functions, uh, and just a lot of wrappers around boil up child strip code. Um, so you have map reduce, fill up, uh, and then other things like find where, which are just really, really nice as uh, functions. That even when I'm outside of my I just use it as a standard. <laughs> yeah. what, what would you say is, is the biggest win in terms of what you, like, you get out of using Marionette as opposed to <coughs> say, just using Backbone? <coughs> Ren, uh, Backbone doesn't implement render. So what you can do is instead of just using, instead of having to design your own render strategy, you just use Marionettes and you just pick the different views that you want to use. So if I want if I want to draw a list, I know I'll just use the collection view or the more complex composite view, which we would use for a table. Um, if I know I just want if I want to build a complex layout, I would use a layout view, which I didn't really go into. But you get basically regions, and you can say when this layout is rendered, when this layout's been finished rendering, go into go into each region and render the specific types that I want as the other sub-views that I want. And then you can render each one individually. And Marionette just has great support for doing that. It's all built in. With Backbone, you'd have, you have to actually do that yourself. You have to figure out how you're going to do that yourself. And it doesn't always work as cleanly, uh, especially because Marionette obviously is much more well supported. Uh, yeah, um, what I'll, that code there is also available on GitHub, so that's under my profile there, which you can see. It, it's a nice little like, complete app that you could just look and start to figure out how things work. I also, that's my personal website, that I'm going to come to the website there as well. That's my personal website. I've <coughs> built that in a way, and I've documented it, so you can actually see how a Marionette application has been built. So it's totally over engineered for what it is, but the purpose is that it has a lot of comments as well. So if you read, if you go on there and it has a link to the source code for it, then you can actually just go through that and pick it apart. So yeah. All right.